speaking to order the, the Temple City regular City Council I, meeting. I'm to here. Order. Yeah, we can hear you. So we'll call the regular meeting for March 16 to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, roll call, please. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Here. Council Member Mann? Here. Council Member Vizcarra? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? She's here. She's here, but I think the I can see her. Okay, Mayor Mayor you? I'm here. Cindy, you're muted. Uh, she it sounds like she's having some internet connection issues. So um We'll continue while we're waiting for Mayor Pro Tem to sign back in. Um, actually, I forgot to read. Uh, uh, so I'm still getting this uh, sharing meeting down. Uh, I probably need to read this pursuant to Section 3 of the Executive Order uh, issued by Governor Newsom on March 17, 2020, exactly a year ago. Uh, City is allowed to hold city council meeting via teleconference, and members of the public can observe and address the meeting telephonically or, et or electronically. So, um, so for those who are calling in, your audio will be unmuted during public comment, or when public comment is open during an agendized item discussion. You can also email your request to speak to city clerk at TempleCity.us right now and indicate on the subject line the item you wish to provide comments. So at this time, um, we we will have our invocation. Uh, it will be presented by Pastor Daryl Kelty, Community of Christ Church, located at 9468 Broadway. Pastor Kelty? I'm always honored to be able to share with the city council. I love this city very, very much, though I don't live in it. I wish I did. So I would offer this prayer on behalf of the city council meeting. Our heavenly creator, who is the source of all good things, we, a few of your children, though we are socially distances from one another, would come into your presence today to ask of your very present spirit that we would open our minds to that spirit. We do this in all humility that we might be able to conduct the business of this city of Temple City. We might do so for the betterment of all the community. We pray also for all those of the staff. They might have the wisdom to do their individual tasks with diligence that would make this city a place to be proud of. And finally, to all of our audience that will be scattered here and there, we are gathered here together to make this city a better place. May we, through our individual and corporate efforts, do our part that tomorrow we might look back and say, boy, I'm glad 2020 is over. This we would say, and thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kelsey. Um, Next, uh, next item is um, Pledge of Allegiance. So, would you all please rise? Ready? Uh, put your right hand over your heart and ready to begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag, flag of the, of United, the United, States United States of America, America. And, and to the Republic, Republic for which stands. Which stands. One, One nation, nation, a nation under God, under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice, for, justice for all. All right. <clears throat> Next item is ceremonial matters. Uh, there is none. Um, 
Next item is public comments on items not listed on the agenda. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any uh, called in? Mayor you there are no email requests for public comments. Are there any, uh, can you unmute the audio? Yes, one second. Audio has been unmuted. Okay. Uh, if you're calling in, please state your name so that uh, you can be added to the public comment list. <laughs> Hearing none, uh, I will close uh, public comment. Um, so if there are no public comment from, uh, from the public, we'll move on to consent calendar. Um, all consent calendar items may be approved in a single motion as recommended unless removed for further discussion. Um, any one from the city council or from the public who want to uh, remove the uh, discuss any of these items? Mayor, you I would make um, a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. It's moved and seconded. Uh, Madam Clerk. Um, Roll call, please. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Vizcara? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Yes. Mayor you. Yes. So the consent calendar has been approved. Uh, next item is public hearing. There is none. And unfinished business, there is none. So. Next item is new business. Uh, the first item is overview of temporary emergency action related to the continuity of city services and personnel and request for direction. Um, Mr. Cook. Thank you, Mary, you and members of the council. Um, as we are starting to get new good news about the pandemic, I, I'm hoping this is one of the last times that I bring this back forward to you or if I do bring it back forward to you in the future, it's in a much more modified format. Um, this has been a tool, uh, the use of admin leave that has allowed us to continue operations and keep things moving forward, properly isolating those who have been COVID, uh, exposed or unfortunately infected with COVID and keeping city operations open. One of the things you'll note too is the substantial difference in the fiscal impact component of this. Um, the last time we presented this to you was in the midst of the entire of the surge. The impact that we're estimating now is almost two thirds less in terms of book value, meaning that's not a budgeted amount, but a, the book value that we put on the financial statements is almost two thirds less. Um, so we ask you for uh, continued consideration as to this measure. Um, Staff is, as, as things get uh, moving forward, we are continuing to move forward on projects on um, beyond going beyond our normal maintenance to uh, additional repairs. Uh, the park staff is doing a great job. The field crews on uh, our building and safety side, planning side, uh, code enforcement side have done an outstanding job as long along with our public works crews. So, if you have any questions of me, I'm happy to answer, but thank you for your continued consideration. And let's hope that the, the light's at the end of the tunnel. Let's hope that we can continue to get there. All right, thank you, Mr. Cook. Um, do we have any council questions, uh, starting with uh, council, council member Chavez? Uh, I have no questions, thank you. Uh, council member Min? Uh, no questions, thanks. Uh, council member Vizcarra? No questions. I may have heard Sam Stern quest. No questions. Uh, I don't have any questions either. Um, we'll open up a public comment. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any emails from the public? Are you, there are no email requests for public comments. Um, okay. Um, then I'll. I guess there's no, nobody calling in either. Are there? No public callers. Okay. 
Uh, we will, uh, I will close public comment in any final council questions or comment from anyone. Hearing none, um, I'm ready for a motion, council motion. <clears throat> Uh, Mayor, you all move to direct the city manager to implement paid admin leave for the period of April 1st, 2021 to May 31st, 2021 for all employees except senior recreation leaders and recreation leaders. Do we have a second? Second. Let's move and second it, Madam Clerk. Roll call, please. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Vistara? Yes. Mayor <clears throat> Proquist? Yes. Mayor Yu? Uh, yes. Um, next item is um, fireworks sales permit. Um, so the city council is requested to provide staff directions regarding the sales and use of safe and sane files. So, um, Mr. Cook. Thank you, Mayor, uh, you and members of the council. Uh, before you tonight is just a check-in. Um, the applications for firework stands are due at the end of the month and shortly before the, your first meeting in May will be the consideration of the applications. Last year, one of the concerns that did come up was the fact that we did not issue paper permits. And that was a concern because um, we were in the midst of the first wave, of the, getting through the first wave of the pandemic. And um, if the concern was if public health had any other conditions or any other issues, that we had the ability to essentially pull those permits based on certain conditions. So we want to let you know that that, has, that will be implemented for this go around of the uh, fireworks permits. And we just want to check in with you if you had any other um, conditions that you felt were important to place on before so that the um, nonprofits had enough time. And um, it's primarily TNT Fireworks, who is the provider of the Safe and Sane Fireworks, um, give them enough time to be prepared for those conditions as well. So with that, uh, uh, you have a brief overview uh, in the staff report of some of the statistics, and we're here for any questions or any other further direction, or if there's no further direction, we will implement the paper permits uh, with the conditions related to um, any emergencies or a ability for the city to cancel with notice. Okay, at this time, I would like to call on the council members uh, for their questions. Uh, Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Mary Yu. Uh, a couple of things. Um, I noticed in the staff report, it indicated that uh, fire chief may allow dangerous fireworks to be displayed by licensed pyrotechnic operators. Who is our fire chief? And is that referred to the LA County fire chief? Because I know we don't have a fire chief. That's correct. That would, be, that would refer to the LA County fire chief if they have a they have a process for the licensed uh, display of fireworks. Okay. And um, I noticed that it says the city's typical enforcement effort is to send out three to three to four two person units and a sergeant between six o'clock on July 4th and 2 a.m. on July 5th to locate and identify people processing or discharging illegal fireworks. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but it's my experience that the illegal fireworks certainly begin before that and may go after that. So is there some way that we can ramp up a little bit of the enforcement this year? Uh, I got a feeling that if uh, things keep going the way they are, July 4th will probably be our breakout holiday this year, as far as people gathering and getting together. And I think it's gonna probably be the most challenging year when it comes to fireworks. So I'm hoping that uh, that maybe we can um, beef that up a little bit. So I, I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Well, and we'll, we will talk with Mr. Zumi and I will talk with the captain and our dedicated team to see. It's, it's just an issue of resources and available resources from a staffing standpoint, but we'll see what we can, we can do 
And if we're able to do an amended uh, operational plan, uh, we will make sure you have plenty of notice on that. Yeah, well, I, I hope we make a good effort to do that because I think it's going to, uh, it's going to be an issue this year. I, I, got, I got a really strong feeling that it's going to just, it seems like every report I've been reading, everybody's saying, well, 4th of July, even the politicians and state and federal saying 4th of July is our, our, our first, our, our freedom, so to speak, holiday, I guess. Um, also, where is this? Have we created this paper permit yet? Or is it, I mean, are we going to see it or, or what, what, how is that going to, to play out? I don't see Mr. Reamer. Oh, that, Mr. Reamers, did you want to? Mr. Reamers here. Hi. Um, we, we actually have a copy of paper permits that were approved um, a long time ago. So we'll be basing our permits on the same permits back then, but we, don't, we haven't yet developed the permits for this coming year. Um, we're still waiting for the permit applications to come in. Aren't, aren't, aren't those due by the end of the month? Applications are due at the end of the month, yes. So, but we don't even have the permit yet. Today is the middle of the month. No, the applications have already been developed. The permits themselves that, okay. that when are those issues? Them is developed next month. Okay, so by the end of next month is the permit. And, that, and that's the document that will allow us the discretion to cancel fireworks that we did not have last year. Is that correct, Mr. Murphy? That is correct, sir. Last year, uh, we relied on the conditions in the code, which did not include a condition that allowed for, for cancellation in an emergency. This year, as uh, Mr. Cook and Mr. Reimers have said, uh, the permit, the paper permit will come to you. I, I believe I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn when I say it'll come to you when you approve those permits uh, early in May. And at that time, you'll, you'll see the, the <laughs> Uh, in front of you, which will include what's in the code, as well as some other legal protections for the city, like the one you mentioned. Uh, you'll approve the issuance of those permits to the applicants, and we will move forward as we've done in the past, albeit with more protection for, for you as a council in case of an emergency. Okay. Great. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council Member Mann, any questions? Uh, yes, Mayor Yu, I got two questions. Uh, the staff report refers to a new assembly bill that might increase the fines. Do you know roughly how much that increase would be? Yes, sir. Uh, the first first um, violation of the state fireworks law would be a thousand dollar fine. Second violation, twenty five hundred. Third and subsequent, five thousand. Uh, in research what fine the city could charge we found an attorney general's opinion that said that the state fines provide a a, a rough benchmark for what city should use so we don't want to go up a thousand dollars right now because right now that's the cap in the state law if this bill is adopted and moves up to the thousand twenty five hundred and five thousand then presumably that attorney general's opinion would still apply and we could mirror the state law and increase our funds to the same level. I see. And a follow-up question to that is, does the state law pro provide a cap or is that a floor for fines? Uh, it, th those, those are the, the, the state law would be, those would be the fines. We could always charge less but we would get into a legal gray area if we tried to charge more or find more than what the state was was issuing. Okay, so it's it's more of a, a if you go over it, then you run two issues. Okay. Right, right. A, a judge may throw it out uh, as being excessive, but as long as we're at or below the state level, we should be okay. Okay, thank you. And thank my you, last question is uh, related to current in the current county tier, um, I'm assuming that allows for sales are, this is the, the county tier affect whether sales are permitted between prior, 
The prior yeah. county years, even before, did not affect. It just dealt with the manner in which retail activities would take place, of which we asked each of the permittees to do. We would do that in this process as well. But there was not there was there was nothing in the prior tiers before purple or otherwise that would have prohibited the activity. The same okay. social distancing, gathering, uh, amount of households, that still all apply, but it did not apply directly to the the use of safe and sane fireworks. So in, in other words, our current understanding of all the tiered system, there wouldn't actually be a situation where they couldn't sell the fireworks. It does not, and in terms of the co context of the current emergency, it does not appear so. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Oh, thank you. Um, Council Member Vizcarra, any questions? Um, yeah, a couple. Is, is, does code, I don't remember, does code enforcement get involved in, in uh, patrolling and enforcing? <clears throat> Mr. Arzuni, do you want to speak to what your uh, your operations plan does? Yeah, uh, it's something that myself and our parking control officers and if our code enforcement is available, along with our special assignment team, and also we do have reserve deputies uh, that do come in that do enforcement and saturate the area uh, on the 4th of July to seek out and identify and cite those that are discharging illegal fireworks. Um, I being one of them, uh, if a citizen is aware that, that there's a lot of Ill illegal fireworks being used in a particular location, is there a way we can contact uh, uh, Arizumi or the sheriffs or somebody and say, hey, take a look? Yes, sir. Um, we do get information prior to the 4th of July whether it's through the sheriff's department or city hall through the city. Uh, if we do get calls of people complaining about excessive illegal fireworks, uh, we will make sure a point to either visit that location prior to the 4th of July to give them a warning saying we received complaints where wherever your location, we're going to be watching you to see if that curtails the activity on the 4th of July. Uh, additionally, we will monitor that location on the 4th uh, while we are on patrol. Great. I've got a couple of addresses for you. Um, yeah. I think that's it. That's enough. All right. Thank you. Uh, um, Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist, questions? I don't have any questions, uh, Mayor. Thank you. All right. I, I only have one question. You know, I, I suppose we have addresses of the frequent offenders from the past. Mr. Azimi? So I wonder. Sorry, Mayor. Yes. yes. Yes, we do have yeah. those that were cited. We do have the addresses. Um, some of them aren't residents, but we know what address that they were cited at that the illegal activity was occurring at. I wonder if um, if the assembly built up past how we're going to distribute that information because that's a lot of that's a pretty big dollar. Um, now, if the assembly bill passes, do we have to pass our own ordinance in order to um, increase the fine? Yes, we would have to go amend our ordinance. Uh, and frankly, I, I don't know that the the bill will pass in time for this year. So I imagine it would uh -huh. be something we would do next year. And then, as you've said, sir, put the word out uh, quite broadly so that everyone understands how much more serious a violation would be in 2022. Right. Our, our current yeah. bills are 1,500 and 5,000 for illegal fireworks. That is our current bill. Was that our current? Okay, thank you, Brian. Okay. Um, that's well, wait, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor. You, I, I, I think uh, I no, missed something ahead, here. Please. So, so, okay. So, Brian, our our current is one thousand twenty five hundred and five thousand, but I thought Mr. Murphy said that the state bill was one was going to be one three and something else. It was, it was, it was like going to be exactly what ours are today, sir. So, so, okay. So we're we're now. We our current code exceeds the state law, correct? That is correct, sir. And is that okay? 
heck, I'm assuming it is since we've way past it. But uh, it's, so it's so this this new bill this new bill really has no effect on us whatsoever. I would put it this way, sir. A charter city has more latitude uh, in areas like this than a general law city does. Uh, there still is the risk of challenge. Now, the challenge to the $1,000 fine for a, a first offense may not go anywhere. Uh, a challenge to a $5,000 fine for a third offense being as out of whack with the state uh, numbers as it is, uh, that that could gain some traction with with the court. Uh, we would have to see if someone were to challenge the fine uh, where that would go. But certainly, I think our our first level, first tier of fines is is perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable, and um, would be supportable if if challenged. Mayor. Uh, yes, I'm Mayor Tim. Um, I just have a question for Greg. Greg, when we talked about the uh fines for mosquitoes why can we have such high fi high fines for the fireworks but we were reluctant to do that when we were looking at the um, fines for the mosquito um, abatement sure I'm, I'm happy to answer that uh I, obviously you part of the issue i i was unaware that the fines uh, for fireworks were set quite this high. The reason that you don't want to set fines too high is because if you set them um, out of line with your other, with your standard fine schedule and you don't have special justification for it, it's more likely that a court would throw that fine out if it were challenged. And so should our fines be more in alignment then than have the fireworks be so much more than the other or vice versa? Well, it, 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 and again, it also depends on, on what you are, what the action that you're trying to stop is and what other entities in this case, uh, with the coming bill, uh, the state are, is doing to try to stop the illegality. Um, Fireworks are something that the state takes very seriously, which is why they're considering revising their fine schedule for it. Uh, if they do, then uh, it's, as I say, it's already been analyzed that cities would be able to follow along with that. Right, it just seems ironic that they don't take West Nile virus and the loss of life there as seriously as they do fireworks. Mayor, may I add to this discussion? Uh, yeah, please, uh, Ms. Davidson. Firework penalties are safety code, uh, section 12700B, which does set the bails that are punishable as a misdemeanor or public offense with fines ranging from $500 to more than $50,000, $50, depending on the gross weight of unaltered uh, fireworks. And so that includes packaging and everything. And so the fireworks can, be five thousand dollars on a first offense, uh, depending on the weight of the total packaging and the illegal fireworks. And so I think that's where the thousand dollar fine comes from is based on the health and safety code. So that's for every city in the county follows that, even in charter cities. This is under the state of California health and safety code. So under the well, that's a discussion for another day. But um, okay, I'm good. Thanks. All right, thank you. Any other questions for staff? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, please, uh, Council Member Viscar. I'm just curious, how does it work if uh, Bill Blow down the street got fined last year a thousand dollars, and then he does it again this year? Is it a thousand dollars, or does it go up to the next level? It's a fine within the twelve month period, and so. If it's if it was previously cited on July fifth, and the offense was this year on July fourth, that is within the twelve month period, and that would technically be considered a second offense. If it's issued on the fourth, and then the subsequent year is issued again on the fourth, uh, that would be treated as a first offense. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. I can tell I, you. Actually, I do have a follow up on that. Uh, is that a state law that says it has to be 
within one year and then the 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 count will start over again? Is that something that we've written into our own ordinance? I believe that's within the law that it's within a twelve month period that the offense occurs. Hmm. Perhaps well, we should consider changing that because I was interested when uh, Councilmember Viscar was saying that well, if they got a fine last year and they do it again this year, maybe they should um, um, pay the higher fee, higher fine. Sir, I, I do know that there are other cities in Los Angeles County that have safe and sane fireworks that are, are looking into um, that exact issue because they're finding more illegal fireworks uh, in their city due to the safe and sane fireworks being sold there, and they're looking at how to ramp up enforcement. One thing that's been looked at is exactly what you say, can we make this into a two-year period or a three-year period? Uh, I don't believe there's a solid answer yet, but I know that it's been looked at by several city attorneys, and I will take a look at that myself and come back to you with that. Okay, so, so when you bring this item back to us in the future, uh would that be the right time when we approve the permit or is that something that we need to do at some other time we could give you a brief update when we approve the permits but we it would not be the right time to make the changes we we would be looking to make changes for the 2022 enforcement cycle all right thank you uh By any other way, questions just, from yeah. oh go ahead just a comment uh i don't know if you watched the news today but uh, a house blew up in Ontario and took a few more with it, and it was packed with illegal fireworks. Wow. Okay, Just any other, okay, any other questions from council? If not, we'll open up for public comment. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any email public comments? Mayor Yu, there are no email public comment for this item. Okay, then I will close public comment. Any council final questions or comments? Um, I'll go around. Uh, council Member Chavez? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I can't understand why an assemblyman would uh, introduce a bill which is not going to go into effect until next year when we still have uh, July is a few months away, but uh, I guess that's how politics in the state work uh, doesn't help us or any other cities out very much. Um, my, my comment is I really feel that fines are no deterrence whatsoever to the use of illegal fireworks. They, uh, just the numbers alone bear that out in the, in the table that was provided to us. Uh, we had 40 pounds in 2018, there was confiscated 25, then it went up to 50 pounds last year. So obviously that's not going down. We keep raising the fines, but the amount of confiscation, and that just, that's just fireworks that are confiscated. We don't, obviously that doesn't count for all the ones that are going off. Um, you know, um, you know I, to me, I think they always felt people who are using these, it's just a cost of business. Um, and you know, I know people don't like to hear this, but I think safe and sane fireworks breed illegal fireworks. And what I mean by that is that um, you know, you can't, we all the people who are caught using illegal fireworks are usually doing both. Um, and uh, it seems to me, and this, and what got me thinking was Council Member Viscar's point. And I know he knows there's certain areas. I know there are certain areas. And for whatever reason, every year, those certain areas are doing illegal fireworks. Uh, why we can't do more to enforce it or to stop that, it's just a very frustrating thing. Um, but um, hopefully we'll get a better handle on it this year, even if we have to throw some more resources at it. And, and I, for one, am prepared to do that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, um, Council Member Min. Any comments or questions? Yeah, actually, I do have a just maybe a question just to clarify. Um, my understanding is part of the reason why it's so hard for us to catch everyone is not only do we have a limited number of 
teams that are out there looking for people setting off illegal fireworks, but they actually have to be the ones witnessing them setting the fireworks off themselves in order to issue that. Like, for example, you can have like a neighbor or someone, a resident that does a field recording of someone setting off the illegal fireworks. That's not enough to type them, right? Is, is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. Well, I, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, maybe Mr. Murphy might want to chime in on that. Uh, certainly a neighbor could report and, 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 uh, and say what they saw um I, my feeling is that is that not that they don't is not that they don't see these things they don't want to get involved that seems to be to me more of the problem i don't see why a neighbor couldn't turn in their neighbor but they don't want to do that for obvious reasons well can and maybe mr murphy can you clarify that for us sure i, I it is possible uh for and, and i i know this from having recently looked at it it is possible to issue citations based on the testimony of neighbors um, those neighbors though then would have to be able to be present at whatever hearing might be held and again so if if the party receiving the citation um, decides to contest it whether that's an administrative citation or a misdemeanor or infraction that goes before a judge uh, the party that saw it and told either your code officer or the deputy that it was going on needs to appear because without that person's testimony, there's no basis for the citation. As council member Chavez said, it's hard enough to get people to want to tell on their neighbors. Some will if they believe that their property might be at risk. Um, but really what they want is to have code officers or the deputies come out and uh, and see the the fireworks on their own and be able to uh, cite based on their own eyewitness test, you know, their own uh, witnessing of it, uh, because those people really aren't going to want to go to court or to an administrative hearing to testify. So it's much harder. Is it doable? Yes. Um, but it's it's a hard thing. And, and I would uh, ask Mr. Arizumi to weigh in on that as well and, and what that might mean to his people. Mm. Yeah, that, that is correct. It would be almost similar to having the citizen place the violator under citizen's arrest uh, and have to go through that process. And a lot of them, uh, as stated, don't want to get involved to that level. They don't mind reporting it. They like to report anonymously. Uh, but if they were ha requested to stand before a judge or before a hearing officer, piece and that our action was take it, uh, action that we took based on their statement and observation, most of them won't get involved, which is why we need to observe the violation. Okay, thank you. So at least my understanding is for all practical purposes, we do need the citing officer to be the one witnessing it, otherwise it goes nowhere. So, I mean, on, on that note, I actually concur with council member Chavez um, and dedicate more resources to, to the enforcement and citation, uh, I, I would be supportive of that. Uh, it seems like we, all of us here know where the usual suspects are and where the heat offenders are. Um, yeah, well, I, I, would, I would be supportive of that. Um, let's, let's see how, how this goes. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Viscar. Any final yeah, that comments brings up, or questions? It brings up a question for me. Um, if if uh, the guy down the street has all his buddies over and, and they're blowing these things off, um, who's liable, the homeowner or the buddies? Well, that really goes to what the code says. And, and uh, I'm... I'm Pulling it up to look at it, I believe right now it is the person who is is actively engaged in the illegal fireworks activity. That's another change that could be made to the code where you can and, and there's a city in Northern California that has done this, uh, the city of Elk Grove, uh, which could be a model for us. Um, they also hold the owner or 
legal occupant of a property to be uh, to be responsible. <laughs> it's a case where, for example, they're lighting the fireworks off in the backyard, and uh, you don't know who exactly did it, but your code officers or your deputies can get to the house. They know that somebody did it, and they go ahead. If we change the code to say this, they can go ahead and cite the uh, the owner or <laughs> the property. That may be something that you want to look into as well, and it's certainly something that I, I think we could help you with if, if you want to go that route. We, we so do I currently like have like that, that place. What? That is something that we do currently have the ability to do. Uh, we do have the ability to cite someone that is in possession of the fireworks and one that is in discharge. Uh, and we treat possession that if it's on private property, the property owner or responsible party uh, is responsible for those fireworks on their property. And so the uh, example that Greg gave, if they're discharging it from the backyard and we are able to pinpoint to the backyard, uh, we can cite the person that is discharging it. We could also cite the property owner uh, for possessing it. Uh, if we do have some instances where they're lighting the fireworks in the middle of the street, then a group of them run onto the property and no one uh, takes uh, ownership of who lit the firework. Uh, we, there's not much that we can do in that instance, but if we do observe their supply of fireworks that are in the driveway or in the uh, uh, table uh, on the front yard, uh, we would contact the property owner and saying that by the fireworks being on their property, uh, it is considered to be in their possession and therefore they would receive the citation for being in possession of illegal fireworks. Okay. And most That's of the true. time you have the violators that'll then come out and say, don't cite my friend, it, it's mine. And then they'll get the citation. Thank you. Somebody talking? Oh, sorry, I, w I muted. I was muted. Uh, Mayor Prince-Am Stenquist? Um, nothing. I, I'm sorry. No, no questions. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have any further questions either, but I do have a question regarding the motion. I think um, um, where the council is being requested to provide staff directions, so, uh, Mr. Murphy and Mr. Cook, do we actually need a motion? Because you heard a lot of comments from us right now. I don't personally need a motion if Mr. Cook doesn't. Uh, as long as you're okay with the plan uh, in terms of bringing back paper citation or uh, sorry, paper permits. Uh, if you're okay with that plan, then we've also received a lot of input on potentially updating the ordinance and the way that we're going to enforce. And uh, we can carry that forward. Mr. Cook, anything else that you need? Uh, thank you, Mr. Murphy. Um, it, the other additional comment I heard was if we can do some additional enforcement. And at this point, from a budgetary standpoint, we're in pretty good shape. So um, I've heard that direction as well. Um, and if we can add a car or two, we will do that. Um, if the council feels more comfortable with a motion to that effect, that, that, that would be fine. But I, we can take that either way, sir. Or is that something, Mr. Cook, that you will bring back to us uh, when we approve the permits? Or that's 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 th thank you, Mary. You that's a very good idea. That's what we will do. Okay. Um, uh, is that Mary, okay, have, uh, Council Member Chavez? Mary, I just have real quick. So I'm just hoping that we kind of move this along because it seems like we have this same discussion every year, yet we wait for just before 4th of July to get it going again. And then all of a sudden we're looking to next year. So it's like the same record over and over. I, uh, you know, we need to, you know, we need to get this, this done. We need to get this in order uh, and, and maybe lessons learned. We need to start sooner in the year, uh, not wait until um, two months before 4th of July to proceed with these things. Uh, Council member, uh, Charles, Chavez, you want to put that in motion so we can um, we can give more direct well, you know, uh, directions? I, well, I was kind of thinking about the same thing you were, Vince, and that is 
you know, what kind of motion can can we go with this? Uh, um, I'll give it a stab. I mean, I, I would make a motion, first of all, that we go ahead and proceed uh, with the staff's recommendation to the paper permit process that uh, we've discussed. Uh, and also that um, uh, direct staff to, to follow up on the comments that were made this evening regarding enforcement, perhaps um, uh, enhanced enforcement this year and other ways perhaps of, of uh, having uh, um, or giving council uh, something more that we could use to uh, to help to uh, you know keep our our city you know safer I guess you could say and that's probably more more motion than you probably need but uh, you know I think uh, I think basically at this time I think staff has heard the comments and and our, I know our staff has always been responsive to that in the past so I, I trust that they will that Mr. Cook will come back with something that. With, uh, to, to take care of the issues we talked about tonight. Um, do we have a second to uh, Council Member Chavez's motion? No, I'll, I'll second that. Uh, Mr. Murphy and Mr. Ku, is that uh, sufficiently clear as a motion? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Viscara? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Yu? Uh, yes. So the motion carried. Uh, we're moving on to the next item, which is the City Homeless Plan Adoption. The City Council is requested to consider adoption of the proposed homeless plan developed to understand local trends in homelessness and related concerns from stakeholders. Formalize existing strategies, identify new efforts to further leverage local and regional resources, prepare for future funding opportunities, and develop a roadmap to guide the city's homelessness response strategies and investments. Um, Jay Manager Cook. Thank you, Mayor Chavez and members of the council. I'll be brief and I'll turn it over to Ms. Chan and then to Ms. Grant. Um, just to let you uh, know- You said Mayor Chavez, by the way. Uh, you said Mayor Chavez, oh, it's uh, Mayor Yu. Uh, we're we're, we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna stay on top of that for you, so. Uh. <laughs> I know, I know, I need to get used to that. <laughs> Sorry about that, Mayor Yu. Mayor Yu and members of the council, before you tonight is, let me introduce a couple folks. Uh, as you know uh, from our office, Ms. Tinny Chan, Another familiar face that you have is uh, Jacqueline Grant with Focus Strategies, who has uh, done some extensive outreach with all of you and lots of stakeholders in the community for many months prior to bringing this plan forward. Also too with us tonight is Samantha uh, Matthews from the um, San Gabriel Valley Coalition of Governments, the COG. And thank you to the COG for funding this effort 100% and providing uh, the uh, opportunity for us and several surrounding San Gabriel Valley cities to uh, bring forward to you a um, practical, pragmatic, but also re hopefully responsive uh, document and plan for the community. Uh, so with that, um, on the, the project management, on the project management side, the project lead for this has been Ms. Chan on our, on our side since the beginning, so I'll turn it over to her. Uh, Ms. Okay. Kent, please. Hi, uh, good evening, Mayor Yu and members of the City Council. The item you have before you tonight is uh, the city's first homelessness response plan. Uh, as you know, the city began this process early last year uh, when the state and the county made funding for city-based homeless plans available through the San Gabriel Valley COG. Um, the city and focus strategies kicked off the process with a series of stakeholder meetings to better understand homelessness concerns in Temple City. Uh, using the findings from the stakeholder meetings, uh, focus strategies and working closely with city staff have come up with a feasible plan with goals and action steps that are not only relevant to Temple City, but are also aligned with the Los Angeles County's approved strategies to combat homelessness. So uh, tonight we have Jacqueline Grant, senior consultant for our focus strategies here uh, to present the plan to you. And we also have Samantha Matthews from the COG 
and she can be available to answer any questions you may have as well. So uh, without further ado, uh, here's Jacqueline Grant and she will be giving the presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much Great. for that introduction. Wonderful. Good okay. evening, Mayor and members. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate being here with, with you all this evening. Um, I've had the privilege, as was mentioned, of working alongside um, so many of your, your city staff departments and have had the opportunity to engage with several members of your community um, and to meet with all of you to develop the plan that's being presented this evening. Um, and I would like to start with really providing an overview of the planning process. So in, um, as was mentioned, in February of 2020, the governing board of the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments made funding available to member cities to be able to develop city-specific homelessness response plans in recognition that responding to homelessness both locally within each city as well as um, at the um, uh, broader regional level really requires that cities and the um, broader county are working together. And I apologize, um, I'm just adding the, the presentation up there now, so hopefully you all can see the, the screen now. Um, and so through the planning process, there were a few key goals that really guided our effort together. The first was to understand the local trends in homelessness within the city of Temple City, to hear from service providers and community residents about, um, and, and people within the city who are most impacted by homelessness about what the um, housing situation was in the city and how the city could best respond given its resources and place within their region. The other goal is to formalize the existing strategies that the city has already been um, utilizing to respond to homelessness and to identify new efforts that could really leverage the local and regional resources available and to develop a roadmap that can guide the city's future efforts um, as the challenge of homelessness continues and as um, resources come into the city to address the needs of residents who are unhoused. And so we engaged in a four-step process for the planning of the plan that is before you this evening for consideration. The first was information gathering and stakeholder engagement. And through this process, um, had the opportunity to review a lot of data on homelessness within Temple City, as well as looking at city policies and planning documents, things like prior housing elements um, and, and uh, regional plans around homelessness. We also facilitated a number of meetings with city departments and community input meetings. From there, key priority needs and concerns were identified that informed the development of the plan that's before you this evening. The plan has five core goals, which are intended to complement one another and to provide a roadmap for the city's future responses. Each goal in the plan is supported by a set of implementation strategies that include supporting actions that can help the city to um, achieve and attain the goal, major tasks that city staff and departments and community partners can pursue together to achieve those goals, as well as metrics to track progress towards the identified goals. And so now I'm going to um, walk through some of the findings and, and key observations that came through the planning process and then introduce the five goals of the city's plan. So first, I'd like to start with really looking at the situation of homelessness within Temple City. As you can see on the charts on this slide, um, over the past five years, homelessness within the city has remained relatively um, as similar, that homelessness has varied slightly from year to year, though we know there are changes um, based on the way that the point in time count happens, that there's minor variances from year to year. But in general, the number of people in Temple City, um, while slightly lower in 2020, that there were 17 people identified who were experiencing homelessness at that time, has fluctuated between about 20 to 30 people over the past five years. Of those people, the majority are staying, um, are reported to be staying in vehicles. 
at the time of the point in time counts in prior years, um, there have not been any emergency shelters or transitional housing programs that are operating within the city of Temple City. And so all of the um, people who are experiencing homelessness who are captured through the point in time count are people who are experiencing unsheltered um, homelessness, whether um, outdoors on the streets or in vehicles. At this time, the primary services that are available for people experiencing homelessness in the city include those that are operated by community groups um, that are um, composed of local, local residents or uh, concerned community members who come together to provide things like meals and hygiene services, as well as some regional services through the Los Angeles Continuum of Care. That includes services such as the coordinated entry system that um, through outreach services or residents visiting access points that are located in nearby cities that residents who are unhoused in Temple City are able to engage in the services offered through the coordinated entry system regionally. In addition to looking at the data on homelessness and available resources, we also met with several stakeholders and facilitated um, stakeholder sessions and input meetings. We met with a total of 27 people that included um, elected officials um, like yourselves, city staff members, homelessness response service um, providers, community groups, and residents. And from, that from those meetings, combined with the data and information that was assessed um, in looking at the planning documents and the information available on homelessness in the region, there were three core concerns that emerged that the plan was aiming to address. The first of these is the lack of available and accessible homelessness response resources that are close to or in the city itself. As I mentioned, there are not currently any emergency shelters or transitional housing programs um, in the city itself. And some of the resources that are in the surrounding region while available have been reported to be um, inadequate in scale to meet the full need of the region's um, uh, need for both emergency and long-term housing resources and supports. Some of the challenges that came up around the lack of available and accessible resources included transportation barriers, um, a lack of awareness of what resources were available or how to best connect to them, and some challenges in navigating the resources due to gaps in um, services being available in people's uh, primary languages. In addition, there was public health and safety concerns related to homelessness, particularly um, as it relates to residents who are unhoused um, and who um, may be impacted uh, most by having a lack of access to sanitary um, hygiene facilities or other uh, um, trash, trash receptacles and other public health needs. And lastly, an inefficient supply of affordable housing for both current and future needs in the city was raised as a large and significant concern across stakeholders. While the city does have multiple ordinances in effect to try to advance affordable housing efforts, um, the high cost of housing in the region and concerns around density have posed challenges historically to increasing the inventory of available affordable housing. And so informed um, by, yes. Yeah, Ms. Grant, um, excuse me. Would you mind us asking questions? Oh, please. Um, I, I was going to ask you um, a question regarding your priority concern number one. Um, I think I've heard this asked of us before. If you provide uh, homelessness uh, services, resources, it encourages uh, more homeless people to move into Temple City. Uh, is that is there any basis for that kind of concern? Absolutely. That's a great question, Mayor. And that is something that um, the in the work that I do, we work with um, cities and counties uh, across the state and the, the Western region. And that's a concern that um, comes up in, in many cities of all different sizes and many communities. And, um, what the data most frequently shows is that uh, that does not actually pan out to be the case, um, that most often people who are experiencing homelessness um, in a community either 
are from that community, were living in that community prior to becoming homeless, um, or have ties to that community, whether that's through connections to um, family in that area, employment resources, um, connection to service um, providers in the area, that there's a link or a tie that's there. Um, the, um, and if not in the immediate city, but in a, a close by neighboring jurisdiction. And so most often, while that is a, a concern that commonly um, uh, comes up, the, the overwhelming uh, majority of people in, in most communities are, are from that community. And um, so service, service access does not in itself tend to be a, a reason that um, people would, or availability of a service um, in and of itself is, is not a reason that people would come newly to a city or area. Thank you. Uh, please continue. Okay, and so um, informed by those uh, feedback sessions as well as the, the data that was available in the community, um, five goals have been identified and I'd like to walk through each of those five goals individually. The first goal that has been identified is to increase community education related to homelessness and housing insecurity to expand awareness of available resources. This item really speaks to um, the goal, the theme that came up through stakeholder sessions in particular, that it was hard to know what resources are currently available and how to access those resources, to know what resources a person might be eligible for, um, and also who resources are designed to serve. And so um, as programs are frequently changing, but also um, there is um, some stigma sometimes attached with connecting to or accessing services that a goal or a way that the city can participate in the effort of connecting people to resources is to make, um, to use the city's platforms as opportunities to share with residents about the services that are available in the region to meet the housing needs of people currently within the city. That would include both homelessness prevention resources, which is a concern always, but a particular concern during this time of the pandemic, as well as services for people who are currently experiencing homelessness, um, which would include not just those uh, services that might be available locally that are offered by community groups, but also services that are available through the broader coordinated entry system. This would also include, importantly, providing some information for your city departments that have the most frequent engagement with people who are reaching out to the city because they're experiencing a housing crisis and looking for resources or information on how to best connect to the services that they need to either prevent homelessness or to um, be able to um, access emergency services or long-term housing support. The second goal area is around looking at opportunities to really increase the resources that are available in the city. And so while the first goal focuses on um, making sure that within the city, people who are most impacted by housing crises, as well as the people who are supporting people in, uh, who are impacted by crises, have information about the services available in the region, this goal looks to see where there might be opportunities to increase um, the resources available to people who are in Temple City who need housing support. Some of the potential supporting actions in this uh, goal area include things like identifying and securing resources to bring services more closely into Temple City. That could include things like having co-located services um, that are co-located coordinated entry services in the city um, or housing navigation services that are available within the city operated by um, regional partners who could help to uh, facilitate some of those linkages to the resources that are available through either the county or the continuum of care or some of the service providers in the region.
The third goal area looks to um, opportunities to really focus on of those services that are available both within the city. So that could include community groups or grassroots organizations, as well as the service provider network in the broader region. Um, the city itself, and then some of the planning groups to look at opportunities to increase the collaboration between those programs so that wherever possible, there's as much efficiency as possible between the coordination of those agencies, there's reduced duplication um, or eliminating duplication, and that the efforts that are underway can really be as impactful as possible. This includes things like um, continuing in some of the activities that the city is already pursuing, things like continuing to engage with the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments in their homelessness response planning efforts, to be able to um, identify both new program opportunities, such as some of the efforts that the San Gabriel Valley COG has rolled out over the prior year, including prevention and divergent diversion efforts as well as things like looking to um, improve some of the um, awareness of smaller organizations and how to improve the linkages between those additionally um, this goal area could include things like looking at opportunities to really build the network of people who are engaged in and supporting the city's efforts. Because there is an active um, uh, local interest in really improving services for people who are unhoused, that one opportunity that the city could pursue is considering the feasibility of developing an advisory council um, of local community residents or community groups or service providers who could assist in um, both helping the city to achieve these goals that are outlined in the plan, as well as other future needs that may arise related to the needs of unhoused residents and strategic planning. The fourth homelessness response plan goal is to continue in some of the coordination activities at the broader region or countywide level. The city has participated in the Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count, which provided the data that was previously um, referenced on the number of people in the community who are experiencing unhoused homelessness in a given, um, on a given day each year. Participating in that count and continuing to do so in years when the county operates it helps to both understand needs locally at the city level, as well as to understand changes in the scope of trends at the broader regional level, and to ensure that resources are able to be um, focused in the parts of the county where there are significant increases um, or uh, populations of people who are experiencing homelessness. And additionally, um, this would include looking at opportunities in the future for other cross-jurisdictional or regional homelessness response efforts. That Time and again, um, we are uh, finding that given the complexity and the scale of homelessness, particularly in LA County, that being able to work across jurisdictions and to identify ways to um, work together and leverage resources is critical for really advancing um, progress in addressing homelessness. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, as I mentioned, these goals all fit together and are, are not uh, numbered in order of priority. Um, is to look at opportunities to really further promote affordable housing preservation within the city. This goal um, speaks to the housing element, which as um, you're aware, is a process that is currently underway within the city. Um, so as the city is working on its current housing element update, the strong encouragement is that the city continue to look for opportunities to um, monitor and preserve affordable housing for lower income households and special populations such as people experiencing homelessness and to look at other ways that the um, the specific strategies within the housing element can really address the needs of people experiencing homelessness or households who are most at risk of um, becoming homeless in the future um, as those affordable housing and housing 
uh, zoning and planning um, strategies are being developed and adopted. Those goals comprise the city's homelessness response plan that is before you this evening. One of the things I would like to note that was mentioned in um, passing while going through this plan is that this plan process was developed during the pandemic. And so while um, the information that is um, included references both you know, longer trends in um, the trends in homelessness within the city, as well as services that have been available, we also know that there are continuing to be new and emerging um, both needs and resources available um, at, during this, this time of pandemic response. And so the plan itself is divided, is designed to really plan um, and provide a practical roadmap forward that has some flexibility as well for being able to respond to emerging circumstances that may come up. So as circumstances come up that um, uh, require shifts in, in priority or specific plans, the um, homelessness response plan itself is designed to both provide that roadmap and direction forward. Um, while allowing for the, the city to continue to um, make adjustments as needed to respond to specific circumstances. Um, and with, with that, I will um, pass the, the presentation um, back to Ms. Chan. Great. So the recommendation for tonight is for council to adopt the city's first uh, homelessness response plan. And so, yes, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, yeah, I, um, I'd like to ask the council if you have questions for um, Ms. Chen, Ms. Ms. Grant, or uh, Ms. Matthews, uh, starting with uh, council member Chavez. Thank you, Mary Yu. Um, gee, I don't know, really know where to start. Uh, I've been jotting notes down and probably too many notes uh, here. Um, you know, whenever we talk about the homeless and we talk about homeless plans, my mind seems to wander back to our mercy housing uh, debacle. Uh, I think we all remember what happened there. Uh, and uh, it doesn't leave a, any good thoughts in my mind uh, as far as, uh, I guess where we move forward. I guess my number one question is, okay, what it, what is our next step? I mean, we let's say we adopt this plan. Is it just, you know, I I I also think back to uh, one of our former council members, uh, Carl Bloom, who used to say it's always nice to have a plan, but it doesn't do any good sitting on a shelf somewhere. Um, uh, where do we go with this? I mean, what what? Or I know it's it's a first step, but uh, I guess that's really up to us. Is uh, you know where 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 do we go, or are there are there are there funding sources that are available to implement these things? Uh, I didn't really see anything in there that identified those kind of things, and especially after trying to recover from COVID, uh, these things, of course, are going to be even. Um, you know, maybe a lower priority, so to speak, on things that we've been doing in the city. So I guess that would be my first question. I know it's a kind of a round, big round question, but uh, does anybody want to take a shot at that? Mayor? Yeah. Oh, it's right. Uh, yeah. I'm the mayor. Um, Tom, from what I understand, you know, being on COG for quite some time and dealing with the homeless uh, plans is that the newly formed re regional housing trust that um, Susan Rubio had graciously um, had the state send a million dollars as a starting point was um, part of a, a pot of money that continues to grow. And if you do not have a housing plan in your city, then you were not part of um, being a, 
it, the money wasn't available to you. So you had to have a housing plan in your city to at least guide you and then participate on a more regional scale where if down the road each city was allocated a certain amount of money, but one city like Pomona who has a lot more land space was able to develop something in the region we could direct our allocation to Pomona. So to just set a foundation, if we don't have a plan, we weren't able to participate in the pot of money. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the plan. I'm just trying to get an idea of, okay, what are the next steps? Maybe, maybe it's too soon to tell. I don't disagree with having a plan. And I certainly understand that having a plan certainly perhaps open the doors to perhaps future funding. But to me, the, the issue of homelessness has always been, you need to provide homes. Everything else is just a Band-Aid. Um, well, and so, our and so where, where, do we, where do we send our homeless, for example? We, we have 17 homeless in the city right now. Uh, is there a plan for, send, I mean, are we gonna be sending them somewhere? Or uh, where is the closest shelter to Temple City? I, I, I know we don't have one, but where is the closest one? Those Tiddy, are the kind of things that I would like to know. Can you address what the city of Arcadia is doing with that new um, designated homeless project? Yes, um, the city of Arcadia recently implemented a, a weekly pop-up um, station of sorts where homeless individuals can come and do their laundry, uh, get information on regional services, um, and, and you know, it, different service providers also set up tables there. Um, so it's, it's, it's a once a week thing, I believe it's yeah, you're on talking about You're talking about the one that's set up over there by the golf course, I believe. It's actually okay. in county area, not city of Arcadia, but, uh, I've heard quite a few complaints from a lot of the people that live in that area as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that of that situation. Um, but I, I don't want to monopolize. I know uh, Mary, you others probably have questions as well, but there are so many questions with that. And I, and I don't expect to really hear the answers this evening because we probably don't have the answers. I know this is the first step and get everything off, off the, uh, you know, to get everything going. So I'll, I'll go ahead and defer to others now, go ahead. All right, um, Council Member Men, any questions? I might be in a similar boat to Council Member Chavez. I, I have a ton of questions. <laughs> uh, I guess my, my first question is one, one of the goals is to provide education and reduce stigma. Um, can you be more specific? Like what exactly are you tr when you say reduce stigma, my assumption is going back to Council Member Chavez's. Um, he mentioned the Mercy housing issue that we we went through a couple of years ago. So I guess my basic question is, how do you change their mind? Like where is that in the plan? And can you give me an example of an actual strategy that has worked in other cities that's comparable to ours? I'll let uh, Ms. Grant talk about that. That's one of the, you know, again, one of the goals that we can try to work towards. But uh, Ms. Grant, is there any examples that you can use from your, your group's various dealings throughout California? Absolutely. I'm happy to share um, uh, an example or two. Um, that's a, a, a great question. And so there are a, a few strategies that, that can be used around some of the community education components. Um, one of the um, strategies that we hear and see most often is effective is to engage with um, for service providers who are engaging in projects in a community, whether that is a new shelter program site, or an outreach program, or um, uh, uh, the opening of an, 
uh, permanent supportive housing development, um, that a, a key element of opening that program is really engaging in community outreach and community education. That we know that there is around um, issues of homelessness, a lot of um, questions, um, a lot of um, uh, conceptions, sometimes concerns, um, sometimes fears that, that people who are housed in the community have. And being able to um, really talk about some of the things such as, you know, really what um, what are some of the, um, what is the, the actual landscape of um, the housing situation in the community? What are some of the reasons that people do experience homelessness? What um, are some of the services offered for people to help engage in, and provide um, connections to be able to attain stable housing and um, connect with some of the resources that are needed for people to really um, be able to gain both economic stability and housing stability. And so we find that really proactive um, uh, engagement strategies that often service providers will partner with community groups in those efforts. Um, there is a role in kind of larger projects that elected officials often have in those efforts as well, really thinking about um, providing opportunities for people who have questions or have concerns to, to be able to um, uh, receive information from people who have a lot of expertise and information about what the programs are and how the programs work, who can answer questions that come up, um, and often to be able to, to provide some of that data as well about really why the programs work and their value in the community and their value um, not just for participants in their program, but their value for the broader uh, community and really helping to um, elevate the um, um, elevate the living situation of you know the residents as a whole. So being able to to help to support and promote housing stability um, within the region. So that's that's one example that we see um, used. Uh, in projects that are most successful in their siting and, and community approaches. Okay, well, um, forgive me for being blunt, but I didn't hear an actual example <laughs> of a city that actually did something that worked. Um, but I, I'm not going to press that issue. I, I, I think your answer illustrates one of the biggest challenges that no one has found an answer to, which is those who are advocating based on the assumptions you're making in this plan fundamentally disagree with those assumptions and and what i see in the plan is there's no effort to address that that you're assuming that people want these services to be you're assuming that there's a fundamental reason that everyone can agree on when no one's even starting at that that same and and you know, in in the staff report at the end, one of the appendices, there's a list of folks that were interviewed as part of development of this plan. And I noticed not a single person on there belonged to the that was massively opposed to the development. And that's already a big misstep in the development of this plan because you're assuming that group's just going to disappear. But, but they're not. <laughs> they're 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 around. They're residents. They live around here, and they will they will come out and 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 say things um, if if you know, this picks up into like an actual tangible. Like for example, um, you brought you brought up the so-called home hub that's the county area of the city of Arcadia. They've reached out to me. They they are aware of that, <laughs> and they say. We don't want that here, Temple City. So, so how do you answer that? Because I, I think the assumption is somehow by simply providing facts that it's going to change people's minds. But we're not really digging into the the root of that issue. Um, and, and there's many reasons for for that, and that's why it's so com complex. And one of them, at least from my own personal experience, one of them has a lot to do with. I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, cultural differences in how the homelessness crisis is being viewed. 
so so how, how do you change people's cultural perspective or sometimes even dare I say moral perspective about, about homeless that there's going to be very different sides of looking at this um, and, and like going back to the list of people being interviewed you know there's a lot from the Temple City Home Coalition who we all know is very active in providing services um, like actual tangible services to the homeless population in Temple City um, and so by just by seeing that list, uh, I realized this plan is disproportionately skewed towards that view. Um, so I, I'm not saying I, I agree or disagree with that. I think the, the plan is a great first step, but I don't think we're asking the right. Uh, I, I, I have my list, but I, I think I'm just gonna leave it. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, um... Councilmember Mint, thank you for that. Um, Councilmember Viscar, any uh, questions? You're on mute, sir. Does it help if you can hear me? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't really have any questions. I, I just have the same frustrations everybody else does. All right, thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist. And you're on mute, Cindy. Sorry. I'd just like to share with everyone, I, I looked it up online about what Arcadia actually got with their plan and what they, it, they're actually um, doing. So I know, Tom, you were wondering, like, what's the next step once you adopt the plan? So I thought this would be helpful. It says, the city of Arcadia applied for and has been awarded three grants from the San Gabriel Valley COG to address homelessness in the city, including the Homeless Plan Implementation Grant, which we we're doing um, the homeless prevention and diversion program grant and pilot program grant. These grants totaled three hundred and eighty thousand dollars. What did that three hundred and eighty thousand dollars go to? The homeless plan impl implementation grant includes encampment cleanup, first responder outreach, training, and emergency resources a full-time housing navigator and their administrative costs. The Prevention and Diversion Program Grant is in partnership with the City of La Cañada, Flint Ridge, who will provide resources to prevent individuals from falling into homelessness or minimizing the amount of time clients face homelessness and will be distributed by Union Station Homeless Services. And then it goes on and it talks about the par three golf course where they have um, case management there, the, um, they provide resources. So that gives you some idea of what the next step would be when you start to implement your plan. And it seems like education of the people that are closest to the homeless population as far as trying to rehouse them um that education component is in um that that um, project for what the money is spent okay so, thank you yeah i just think it's important to to know that there's there's not just one thing that the plan is going to address you know it, it's a lot of different things, but I think the Regional Trust Housing Fund is really going to catapult cities into being able to meet the needs of their own city. So if we felt that money from our, whatever portion of money that was sent to our city, and we felt that a lot of that money needed to be to educate our residents, then I think that's something that that grant would allow us to do because I do agree with 
William, that we face a unique situation here in our city that we are all quite aware of, you know, with the Mercy Housing um, project and that whole mess. But, it, you know, it, it, it comes down to, do we want our cities to be, you know, I, I have seen more and more homeless now that I've been out and about more since I've had my second vaccination going to the markets and you know, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's just, you know, it, it hurts me because I think, you know, what if that was my son or my daughter or my mother or my brother? And I would hope that people would have compassion. And I think we have a, a moral obligation to do something for our homeless. I don't know what that answer is, but I think that the plan at least gets us engaged. I don't think the, the plan is a, a cure-all for anything, but I think it kind of just puts us on the playing field, if you will. So, you know, I, I, I want to thank you for the work that you've done on that. I know it's not an easy task and the questions are difficult sometimes for people to answer honestly because no one wants to feel like they're just throwing homeless people under the bus, but then people have some real strong feelings about why they would move to a certain area and why they wouldn't want to, you know, um, have homeless in their area. So I think it's, I don't think it's ever going to really be the, the right answer, but I just think it's a start for us. That's all, Mayor. Uh, thank, thank you, um, uh, Madam Mayor for Tim. I, I, this is meant to be for uh, time for council questions. I don't particularly have any questions. I may have a comment that I will reserve until after the public comment and, and, and I will make that. So at this time, I would like to open up for public comment. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any email public comments? Mayor Yu, there are no email public comments, but I do have a caller that wished to make a comment. Yeah, would you unmute the phone and call her? Would you please say your name uh, for the record? Thank you, Mayor Yu. This is Jim White. Uh, and congratulations on your, on your ascension. Uh, I've, uh, I've worked with the coalition uh, and attended some of their events. And, uh, and I'm actually executing a project that I'm going to try to be very vague about because uh, I'm not sure the legality of it, um, but uh, I've got some anecdotal experience uh, with with homeless people, and I I would I would like to state up front that involuntary homelessness is tragic and should be uh, assisted at every chance um, to get people that don't want to be on the street off the street. My experience has been that involuntary homelessness is a minority of the problem. You got a lot of people on the street because they don't want to live by rules. They don't want to live uh, under other people's conditions. And uh, Mayor, you brought up a, a spot on question about whether or not uh, making the city attractive to homeless people is going to attract more homeless people. And there were there was a series of articles in the Star News several years ago about a church in Malibu that has been providing a weekly dinner for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And the Malibu residents are getting upset because homeless people are busing in from other communities, enjoying their dinner, and then uh, sacking out in their front yards because they can't catch a bus back that night. And it's becoming a mess. They're, they're uh, relieving themselves in people's yards and they're devaluing the property. Now, if you go down to Venice Beach, you want to live in Venice Beach, you either need to be a multimillionaire or you need to have a broken down van or motor home that you can park in the street and drain your sewer right into the gutter. It's a mess. Uh, Santa Monica is becoming like that. Santa Monica Promenade, you've got teenagers living on the promenade and it's it's terrible for the community. It's terrible for the people that have saved and, and scripted and worked their lives to own property there. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about affordable housing. Well, it's not really the city council or the government's job to provide affordable housing. And 
so-called affordable housing devalues the property that people have saved their lives and and uh, worked their lives to buy in the city and i know a number of you have property in the city and it's just going to be devalued if uh if somebody interferes and starts setting prices you know people talk about a lot of money that's being set aside for programs and there was money that was set aside for the study and yet the people in the coalition are donating their own time and money this money would be better spent going straight to the problem straight to the to the people that are actually dealing in the front lines um maybe maybe some of that money should be earmarked for paying homeowners or landlords to open up their homes at whatever price they're willing to to rent their homes uh you know section eight comes in and tells uh homeowners how much they can charge for their homes and in a city like temple city that does not amount to much and it doesn't make it attractive to homeowners and landlords to take the risk on people putting them in their homes uh, i see that my sand in my hourglass has, has run out uh mayor man uh council member man you made a bunch of uh cogent comments that i that i uh that saved me a little bit of time and uh, uh Former Mayor Chavez, uh, you did also. It's uh, people that are on the street involuntarily uh, know where to yeah, go. Mr. Walker, please uh, conclude uh, your comment. I would like to, to address the education part. Educating the, the citizens seems like um, an exercise in futility. Ex uh, educating people that are on the street where to find resources is where the education should be spent. Temple City right, has you, Mr. White. that provides a lot of resources. Yeah, thank you, Mr. White. You're three minutes up. Thank you so much for your comment. Thank you, Mayor. We thank you, Council. It. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other caller who wants to speak? Mayor, I did not receive any re other requests. Uh, hearing none, I'll close public comment, and I will go back and ask the council for any final questions or comments um i'm sorry member to, i'm sorry to interrupt i do have another caller pastor kelty is it okay if i unmute his microphone to see if he wants yes, to see yes yes please uh, madam clerk uh please unmute uh, pastor kelty's phone pastor kelty. i'm on yes uh this is pastor kelty the temple city community christ i had a question just on the report itself I have been doing part of the point in time counts for the last three years, and I would wonder where those numbers came from. Specifically, they're far too high for the people we've actually counted at the time. I understand the county does some adjustments to it, but I've never found out the formula for those adjustments. So I would question those accounts, those numbers. But I'm really concerned about page 22 of your report. Or, excuse me, page uh, 25, I'm sorry. It's uh, the table below summarizes the goals, supporting actions, and major tasks of the City of Temple City Homeless Response Plan for February 2021 through. I do not see anything in there about building any units or finding a, uh, affordable units. It's all talk about what we're going to do, but what are we going to do? How many units are we get planning to build by 2023, or, or at least in the planning stage for building through 2023? Now, do this the key departments of personnel, utilize materials, support and action, but there's nothing about any concrete goals. Um, Pastor, uh, we don't hear. Are you done? I'm here. Are you done with your comments? Yeah, I'm through with my comments. I'm just, we all. I'm waiting through with my comments. I was hoping I'd get some answers back. You're more than welcome to mute me down. Okay. If that, those are your comments, well, I'll, I'll, when you finish, uh, I'll ask uh, if um, um, Mr. Cook or anybody would like to respond to that question. <clears throat> the city, <clears throat> the plan does not have an inclusionary housing ordinance or any other 
uh, plans to build those types of units. That would be a broader policy uh, discussion with the council um, at a different date and time. But um, based on the feedback that we received through the process and others, um, and also to the cost of, of property and land, land values in the city, it would be a significant challenge to provide that type of resource. That's why, as <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem alluded, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Ch uh, excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist alluded to, um, we're looking towards things like regional um, efforts, like the Housing Trust Fund, where those types of projects that are much more a bit, have the ability to get off the ground, have the ability to assist have the ability to refer to as well, just to be quite frank, uh, has that ability um, with uh, the resources that are there and uh, the ability to build those projects. Um, we have, uh, and Mr. Reimers can speak to this a little bit, we have a real challenge even with the state laws that would allow for affordable housing. The private market is not really coming in to do a lot of those um, types of projects now and even with the density bonuses that are allowed under state law to do that the economics are very uh, complex and the economics are quite frankly very expensive so um, the fact that we don't have something in there is because <clears throat> because of some of the economic factors we don't have a tangible project or area that we could say yes that makes some sense in this part of Temple City to look at those types of projects at the, at this point in time. I, hope that I, I, cer I certainly agree. I've lived in Temple City all my, well, I don't live in Temple City, but I was born and raised in Temple City. But if we're not gonna build housing in Temple City or affordable housing in Temple City, uh, why do we need to do uh, some of goal A, increase education about homelessness, Within the city, expand awareness of available resources and reduce stigma. What good is that? Um, Pastor Cowdy, do you have any more comments? Thank you for that. No, no. I just, okay. you know, I just wanted these these steps are all well and good, but like uh, Councilman Chavez says. Uh, if we don't do anything, if we don't help another city, it's going to become a, a, a piece of paper and on a shelf without anything getting done. It's my problem. Okay. We appreciate that comment, uh, Pastor. And um, okay. Uh, okay. Any callers, uh, Madam Clark? That's all, Madam if not, I'll close public comments and I'll go back to the council for final questions and comments. Uh, council Member Chavez, would you want to go again? Um, lead, lead in any questions or comments? Thank you, Mayor Yu. Um, uh, first of all, I want to just make sure I'm clear in that I, I am not against the homeless plan adoption. I think it's, a, it's overall a, a, a good plan. I do think, with all due respect, it is more of uh, just a generic plan that really could apply to most cities in the state of California. Just plug in the different city name and all these things will, will still apply mostly. Um, but be that as it may, uh, it, it has some good points. Um, I, you know, I, it, inter the, the interesting thing for me was that this, uh, I forget if, I don't know if you could pull that up, the numbers where the numbers went up and down over the last few years. Um, you know, I, I, I'm i not sure and I, I'm just thinking out loud, but uh, you know, uh, we all know, remember Pastor Palmer uh, from, uh, I think it was the First Methodist uh, Church and he ran quite an aggressive uh, uh, program for the homeless and uh, provided uh, many things for them and just, mm -hmm. It just dawns on me when I'm looking at this graph that uh, it was really going strong back in uh, 2017, 2018. And if you look at that graph, that's when we had the most homeless. And now that he's gone, uh, I don't think they're still doing the same kind of things they were doing before. 
And now all of a sudden our numbers have gone down almost half of what they were before. Uh, again, I don't, I'm not sure what the validity of these numbers are, or where they came from, but um, you know, that there, there, there seems to be some, some, uh, some, something ironic about that anyway, to me. Um, and we've been talking about affordable housing versus homeless housing. I, I don't really think the two equate with each other as far as what the state is expecting of us and what we expect to do. I don't think they mean the same thing, to be honest with you. Um, and I think uh, uh, city manager Cook mentioned this earlier that, you know, because of the values and the land and a whole bunch of things. I mean, we there, there, there is no homeless shelter. There is no homeless housing that's on the horizon, especially in Temple City. And, and this gets back to what I think Council Member Mann alluded to, and that is, um, you know, our city has a certain type of mentality when it comes to those types of things. And if we're going to do anything with this plan, certainly, uh, and I know there's been talk about the educational process, the community education related to homelessness. I, I think that goes both ways, not only, uh, and it would certainly help in our city, and that is to educate the, the people in our city as to what can be done with the homeless and take that stigma away and also provide education, of course, to the homeless and where they can get help. But I think that's a different issue. I think those are, are two different issues, certainly. Um, just real quickly, you know, this Arcadia plan, I know, I know Arcadia has taken credit for it, but in reality, that is in county property. And that area is a big known area for homeless. There's a trail there where, where the homeless are, are there. We've got that big uh, water area there. And that was just an, an, a place where they decided, hey, this is going to be a good place for it. But now I've gotten a lot of feedback from the people who live there who are also in the county, but also consider themselves kind of quasi Temple City people. And they're saying, hey, we don't want this here. And, and I can't even imagine if we were to put something like that in Temple City. <laughs> I mean, we saw what happened with Mercy Housing. I mean, that, that isn't going to happen, at least until we can educate our people. So if anything comes good about, out of this, if we can get some money uh, that's available to, to help us with the educational process, to help us with these other things, hey, great. I think that's an awesome thing. And I think certainly it'll help. So, um, you know, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a, a good step. It's a good first step in the right direction, I think. But, but as I said, uh, as, as we, we need to know, we need to remember uh, we can't just put this on a shelf and forget about it. We, we really owe a duty and an obligation to our community and to everyone to, uh, to do what we can to, uh, to combat. And, and my, my last comment, um, I went downtown to court today, which for the first time I've been, haven't been downtown in LA for a long time. I was going back to get on the freeway. Uh, you want to get a good impression of homelessness. Take a drive down to uh, downtown LA. Mm -hmm. um, every street has a has tents set up all over the place, and that that is a that is a a, a tough tough situation. There's no question about it. Um, you know, and uh, if we can be of any help in any way, uh, you know, obviously uh, we need to do something about that. So. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Councilmember Chavez, uh, Councilmember Min. Oh, yes, thank you, Mayor Yu. Uh, I, I do also want to just clarify, I do appreciate the work that went into developing this plan. We have to start somewhere. So having a broad framework in place allows us to have a reference point from which we can try to move forward where we can. Uh, what what I would, I guess, maybe more of a comment or critique, however you want to take it, uh, I do think in order for any of these plans to be even remotely feasible, there has to be a much more nuanced, specific approach. It has to be very specific to Temple City. Um, by reading, I get a sense that this plan was developed without considering what 
happened several years ago with Mercy Housing. I think largely not ignored or not considered, um, especially due to the lack of outreach to the parties that came out vocally. And, and if I recall at the beginning of the effort, uh, how it was suggested that some of that outreach because if you're not gonna talk to the primary opposition, how are you even achieve it unless your plan is supposed to ignore those voices of the community, which isn't gonna happen. <laughs> so, so this plan has a lot of holes in it. Um, a lot of missing steps, a lot of missing information. Uh, and I, I feel like it, it, if we move forward blindly just following this, we're gonna get any. Um, you know, I, I agree with Pastor Kelty's remarks in the sense that, uh, and also Council Member Chavez, I, I would not want to just see a plan. I mean, and then I think I, in, in my discussions with City Cook, I mentioned, you know, bring bring me specifics. I want to see like, hey, this is what we're gonna do. Okay, this is where the money's gonna come from. And then, you know, I know there's so many categories that this plan is trying to capture, but what about flagging the ones that make the most sense for us? Like, what's the low hanging fruit? And, and low hanging fruit, I don't mean by just going out, having some town hall meetings and every chit chats. We, we've had that before and it was a disaster with the housing. <laughs> Those town hall meetings were just filled with negativity it was just drowned out by voices that just didn't want to hear anything, right? And so we've gone through that before. Why do we want to go through the same mistakes? We wouldn't be learning from that. Um, so I think that aspect of the so-called community education really needs to be revamped, specific to our city, specific to our experience, specific to our residents. Um, I see a lot of tangible metrics. Um, I, I hope as we plan further moving forward, we actually have a way to measure success. And I don't consider attending a lot of regional meetings as a metric for success. Um, to me, that's just adding more verbiage to a plan. Uh, it, it doesn't really do anything. Uh, one thing that I thought was very poignant from the plan, uh, actually, I think it was, was from one of the templates uh, of for for questions we should ask: how to identify individuals and families in Temple City who are at risk. Because I think a bit a big part of where I think our city where we can do a large amount of good is finding those people who are on the verge of homelessness and preventing them from falling into homelessness. And, and we, the, the story that always pops up in the head, again, during this Mercy Housing issue, there, there was an article, I believe, by the trip that basically interviewed some of the residents of the Golden Motel. And one of them was a family that had a young daughter that stayed at the motel because they wanted to attend temple schools. Now, how many people actually know about that case? Um, I mean, if you start reaching out personally to the people, the families who have kids that are friends with that family, I think that's a much easier avenue to maybe sell these ideas to people when there's a personal connection. I mean, too often we paint homelessness in these broad, these broad generic strokes, and no one really connects with it unless you've experienced homelessness yourself or know someone who has. And I think that's what's really lacking is there's no connection to that. Um, so I hope we can put some emphasis into actually identifying folks. And it seems like at least with serve, uh, local groups like the Homeless Coalition, they've already kind of done some of that legwork in identifying those. So where, where does the, how do we, create a plan that allows us to tie into to that existing infrastructure or database or network, so to speak. Um, so I, I want to 
remain mystic and forgive my cynicism and my comments because of what we went through several years ago. I, I, I can't help it. Um, and, and for the folks who have seen this on our council tonight, they have reached out to me privately and expressed great concern about what that next step would be. They said, I read through the whole thing and I don't see what that next step is. And that concerns me because they see the news articles reporting about the homeless held in Arcadia or unincorporated county Arcadia. So, so there's a lot of misconceptions, right? The article focuses on one thing and people assume that that's gonna be replicated everywhere, right? So th these are the things we're, we're trying to fight against uh, when, uh, when we're, we're trying to you know, address this issue. Uh, on a on a city specific. Um, I've said enough. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, Councilmember Viscar, any uh, final questions or comments? You know, if you think about this enough, it, right now I feel like my head's going to explode because, or, and I haven't had all the experience you guys have had with it. Um, it just seems like. I'm not hearing doable viables. It, 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 it's we're 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 floundering all over the place, and and what is our charge? You know, I I'm not even sure I understand what our charge is, and and, and what the driver is for that charge. So, I guess all that to say is, I don't have any idea which way to go, but it seems okay. that that. At some point, we're going to have to get off the dime and do something. That's all. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Scar. May I protect Strenquist? Yes. Um, you know, I during questions, I shared a lot of my comments, but I just want to share that, you know, I, I so disagree with the comments that Mr. White made in regards to education of one side versus another being futile. I mean, listen, we as a council, time and time again, we all in unison say that whether it's new trash service that's coming into play in our city or something that, you know, is controversial in our city, that the key to that issue is always education. And that's education on not only the trash servers who service our city, having them understand the uniqueness of our city and where we've been with our you know, current trash service being twice a week. It's also a responsibility of the residents to want to learn how to optimize the new trash service that we have. So we have a problem in our city. I don't care if we have 10, 20, 30 homeless, they're visible. We all know that there are homeless in our city and we need to educate our residents on how to best, you know, deal with a homeless person if they see them. Um, you know, how to respond to a homeless person, probably best just to ignore them. We need to work in unison with our first responders who deal firsthand with the homeless people. And I'll tell you something, you know, we recently sent out a, um, a statement from this council saying that, you know, we are not going to, um, you know, there's no place in this city for hatred of any race, any nationality of anyone. And I have people calling me and saying, I don't understand why that statement went out publicly from the council because I didn't realize there was a problem in Temple City. And I said, well, you know, there's, there's a problem everywhere with concerns about racism, et cetera. And I thought, you know, maybe had we put a little bit more education into even a public, something public like that, even though it's not closely related, it is part of education. If people don't know 
about something, they don't understand it. And they they take in the worst sometimes of what a situation is. And it was like, oh my gosh, what's happening in Temple City? Temple City's going to the dogs. You know, you can't walk down the street without getting hit with an ax. And I'm like, this, you know, this is somebody put this on Facebook and it explodes. Somebody put, put something on homelessness on Facebook and it explodes. So I feel that by having a plan, we're we're in it. we've taken that step you know we've taken that step just like we publicly said where there's no place for um racism in this city well we can't get rid of that because some people are just racist and we can't get rid of homelessness but we can learn to come together to understand what the situations are and how we can best work together. And I think that's what the plan does. And I wanna remind all of, of, of us on the council that um, Jacqueline interviewed every single one of us individually to see what we wanted in this plan. And I have to tell you, everything I talked to Jacqueline about is in that plan. So, I mean, I, I, I did mention Mercy Housing and I know that Jacqueline took into consideration, you know, in maybe not just isolating that one situation, but um, we all were interviewed and said, look, at these are the things that we think are pertinent to our city. And I mean, I, I know it's difficult to come up and say, okay, well, okay, well, this is the first thing we're going to do. And now we're going to do this. But I just feel by like having a plan, and I don't want it to sit on the shelf. And I think that's our individual responsibility is to not let it sit on the shelf. And we need to come to the plate and say, okay, that's been sitting for too long. I mean, I did that with Brian today. I said, hey, Brian, what's happening with our plan for the um, chamber site? You know, I mean, I sometimes I have a memory of an elephant. You know, I can remember things 20 years ago, but I can't remember where I put my keys two minutes ago. But we have a responsibility to make sure that those things, those plans are invoked and that we we tweak them and we work through them. But for me, this says I'm engaged. I'm I'm ready to do something, whatever that is, because I'm not the expert on homelessness. But I know there's been a lot of people for the last five years working on this day in and day out. And I, I'm just ready to move forward with this plan. And, and I think it's a fluid plan, right, Jacqueline? This is not something that's just, it's something that can be added to, can, you know, can expand or tweak down. I mean, I, I just think it's it's a start for us. So that's all on my bandwagon anyway. No, thank you, um, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I said I was going to make some comments also uh, instead of questions. Uh, uh, first of all, um, I appreciate um, um, Sangiro Valley Cock for um, financing uh, the plan. Really, thank you for that. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of great comments made tonight. Uh, I think one was expressing really frustration on we don't know where to go from here uh but and then we're also talking about uh it wouldn't do people any good if there's no affordable housing and but i personally feel that there is just so much uh knowledge and wisdom and research been done on homelessness and there may or may not be a perfect answer and i think um like council member men and others have pointed out there has to be a temple city um specific solution. And I think one thing, however, we all do agree is that none of us want to, wanted this plan to sit on the shelf. We all want to do something about it. But yet, at the same time, as the Mercy Housing had been pointed out before, uh, we are elected to represent the people. And there, apparently, you know, it doesn't matter what the five of us think here. Um, there is a, perhaps, disconnect or disagreement that a lot of our residents have um, uh, 
regarding providing or bringing in homeless services. And that's why I asked the question, when you provide the service, does that mean that, because that's, um, in my opinion, it's a, perhaps it's a misconception, but a lot of people think that's gospel. If you provide it, they will come. So I, I think I would not say that um, education is a key. I would rather perhaps um, call that engagement. I think when we say we need to educate our residents, we, um, I guess, in, implicitly are telling them that they're wrong and we're right. Um, I, I, I would much rather engage the community to really understand what the concerns are. But, but I think this is a, homelessness is a big issue. Um, in Temple City, um, should we really, I think, um, Council Member Vizcar asked, I don't even know where we stand on this. I think as a city, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to be part of the regional solution? And I think most of us felt that we need to be a regional solution. Uh, but yet at the same time, we all know a lot of our residents do react to it. And council member men pointed out the fact that we're engaging, we're talking about homelessness. People somehow jump to the conclusion there'll be homelessness in their front yard. Um, so, but I do think there are a lot of um, things we can do in between. Uh, call it education, call it data gathering, call it um, um, engaging with our, uh, more people that know how, how this is, should be done, uh, research into how funding could be obtained. I know the county is doing a lot of uh, work on this using Measure H money. And um, actually, uh, Personally, I'm a little engaged in some of those activities as well, but really more of a, from a construction point of view. And and the city manager is right. You know, we to build affordable housing in Tumbo City is probably not something we can undertake all by ourselves. And um, so, but I agree that um, um, like um, uh, council member. Um, Travis pointed out is our duty and obligation to a lot of our homeless folks out there, and I don't know whether you see that see them as Temple City residents, but we always have some some of us who are homelessness who are experiencing homelessness. They are in, in Temple City. Are they not our residents? They, I, in my mind, they are our residents. Uh, they just don't have a home that they can go back to like the rest of us. So. Um, I I would be very interested in, uh, and I think all five of us have said here tonight that we don't want the plan to sit on the shelf. So I think the, having the plan is great, and thank you for the, all, all the good work, um, Ms. Grant, and um, and then all the St. Gabriel uh, 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 Valley uh, Council of Government. Thank you, Ms. Chen. I think. It's time for us to really take this seriously and and maybe come up with a way to move on to to the next step. Could be a small baby step. I, I think we all um, wanted to to take some action here. So, Mayor, you, can I uh, make a suggestion if you don't mind? Yeah. Um, I think it was somewhere. I can't remember. I thought I read it in a report somewhere that one of the possibilities, and this goes with. And I think tonight we've heard that uh, for most that. Uh, that uh, you know, it's important, of course, to have a plan. Uh, we don't want it to sit around. Uh, it's something that we need to really go forward with. And 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 Cindy, you have a good memory because I I, I do remember talking with Jacqueline, but I can't remember a word I said to her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, Jacqueline, wasn't this like I think I don't even think I was the mayor when I talked to you, which is that how long ago it was? Um, it's been going on for a while, but anyway. Uh, I think it would be a good idea, and of course, uh, Mary, it's up to you, but perhaps maybe thinking about setting up an advisory committee to maybe look into implementing this plan or moving forward. You know, back, a few, and some of you who've been on the council for a while maybe remember, we did have sort of a, not, it wasn't really geared to homelessness, but remember we were working with the churches a lot and trying to develop things that uh, that were consistent with 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 things that they were doing with what the city's goals were i think and, and we still have that committee actually i i was just noticing on the list of uh of new appointments that that were made tonight um 
I couldn't even, I didn't even remember myself, but apparently I'm the liaison to the, the clergy, which, uh, uh, you know, I, I can tell you right now, the clergy and I haven't met for quite a long time. So um, we, uh, you know, it, it might be time, and, and this would go towards not letting this sitting on the shelf. And we've done this before, where we've had an important goal, and we've we've taken that, we've taken the first step, hopefully by adopting a plan, but now taking the next step, and that is to have uh, another committee or someone look into ways to implement some of this plan. Of course, there are things that we're not going to be able to implement. It just isn't gonna happen overnight. But as I think you just said, taking those baby steps and doing things that we can do. And I think William mentioned before, some of the low hanging fruit things that of course, uh, you know, we can we can certainly consider. So, I mean, that would be my suggestion. And, you know, I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but. Uh, uh I think that's a wonderful um, uh, suggestion, uh, Councilmember Chavez. Um, so, Mayor, can, I just wanted to ask Tinny a question. Uh, Tinny, do you attend the monthly regional trust meetings for the housing trust? Uh, well, Temple City isn't part of the regional housing trust, but I am attending. I'm part of the homeless working group, so they have monthly meetings and we get updates from all the cities on what they're doing uh, for their homeless plans. And we get a lot of good ideas and we also get presentations from dis different service providers. And so, yeah, we I am a part of that working group. So can you maybe give us a monthly update on on those things that you, you know, the other cities are doing and so we have a, you know, an understanding of some of the things that are working possibly and some things that maybe aren't working definitely okay thank you so perhaps um taking this next step uh, may be to um you know approve the plan tonight and then um set up another maybe a subcommittee of, uh, consisting of council members to what well, were staff to come up with something um you know baby steps if they as they may be to uh and then bring back for council for consideration perhaps so th those are my comments um are there any other additional comments or suggestions otherwise i guess uh i'm ready for a motion to to receive the uh uh and uh or to adopt the uh first ever homeless plan um, are we going to need a motion, Mr. Mayor? Are yeah, we going to need a motion so. to set up a, a committee? Um, I don't know, um, uh, Mr. City Attorney. I don't think we've been for a subcommittee. We uh, just just a direct appointment, right? But but that could uh, yeah. be part of a motion too, as well. Cert certainly could be part of a part of a motion. Definitely need one to adopt the plan. Um, as far as uh, a standing committee goes, sir, you can do that on your own or or you can do it by council motion either way. Yeah. Hey, Mayor Yu, I would propose the following motion that uh, we adopt the um, city-based homeless plan as presented this evening and that uh, also uh, ask that uh, Mayor Yu consider um, creating a standing committee to uh, to look into ways, uh, uh, future ways of implementing the plan. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, I'll second it, but I have a question. Does it have to be to implement the plan or to implement a plan? Well, my understanding is that we, we are adopting a homeless plan and, and of course, uh, uh, the job of the standing committee would be to look into ways of uh, of uh, implementing the plan as adopted. Uh, I, I don't know that they would have the authority to change the plan. Right. So tonight, really, before I said adopting it, and then the standing committee will bring back, uh, I guess, recommendations uh, with staff's uh, uh, help. Uh, to bring back some implementation uh, actions for council to consider. And maybe funding is required for some of these actions. Okay. 
So we have a motion and a second. Um, Madam Clerk, may we have a roll call, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Vizcarra? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Yu? Uh, yes. Um, I guess we can even uh, appoint that uh, standing committee right now because while uh, while we are still on this subject, we don't have to wait for the until the next uh, agenda item. So, uh, do we have volunteers um, who would like to serve on the standing committee? I I don't mind. I would volunteer. Okay. Um, the rest, um, Councilman Chavez and Councilman Marin, uh, you you okay with that, right? Sure. Uh, it, yeah, I don't mind them serving on it. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Actually, I'm very curious myself, but I don't think I can afford the time. So uh, thank you, um, Council Member Vizcarra and uh, Mayor Pro Temp uh, Sternquist uh, to serve on this committee. That's why I tell you, you need to retire there. <laughs> Well, don't encourage me. Um, so thank you, uh, Ms. Grant, uh, Ms. Matthews, and Ms. Chen for your for your good work. So moving on to the next item, updates from Mr. City Manager Cook. Mayor, you members of the council, I'll be brief. Just two items tonight. Uh, as you probably read in this paper, and I provided some information to you, the stimulus, the latest stimulus package does provide some direct financial support to cities throughout the country. We are part of what are called the non-entitlement cities, meaning that we do not get funding directly from the federal government. We It either goes to the state or goes to the county. Um, we are starting to slowly learn some of the details of that. So it's not 6.7 million that's gonna fall from the sky and, and come to us based on a reimbursable basis. But one of the areas that may be able to help us capture a good portion of those funds is revenue losses between fiscal year 18, 19 and the following years subsequent thereafter. If that's the case, that's probably about three to $4 million that, of revenue loss between um, sales tax, our um, parking permit fees, our parking fines, other things as well. But uh, we can't count those, uh, count that just yet. Um, we're going to go through a process. The Treasury Department, along with the state, will come up with some guidelines similar to the similar to the manner in which they did with the CARES Act, of which we were able to get all of that money. But um, it's it's needed. It's one-time funds. It, there's some there's some uh, things that are precluded in terms of funding, uh, including uh, pensions and other other costs that we will have to segregate out to ensure that we are using those funds correctly, uh, and we we feel that the, we've used those funds in a defensible manner. That will be brought forward to you as soon as that comes forward, and as we're developing the fiscal year. 21, 22 budget, it will be extremely tight. Uh, uh, and so these are funds that are much needed at this time, even though, again, as uh, former Mayor Chavez pointed out in the state of the city a couple weeks ago, you do have a very robust fund balance uh, that includes a fund, a, a fund balance for economic uncertainty. So, um, but this additional funding can really help uh, fill those gaps as we filled some gaps last year as well to close out and balance uh, with some one-time funds for the fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, and we'll come back to you fairly soon with some uh, preliminary thoughts. Uh, Mr. Cook, do you think the admin leave we've been uh, approving all that time would, uh, is how it could be reimbursed? Yes, even though it's not something that you you directly fund in terms of from a budgetary standpoint, it's something that sits on the financial statements. So yes, that is something we would consider as a potential cost factor. So that that cost, along with other 
cost, for example, our, our clinic that we did and the staff cost with that clinic is something else we would ask for and line item out and show here are some costs that we incurred, even if they're direct or indirect, like admin leave is a little bit more indirect than the actual staff cost of doing a, a vaccination clinic. So yes, absolutely, Mary Yu, that's what we'll be doing. So more to come, but at least some exciting news. We can anticipate some level of uh, reimbursement coming back to the city. How much that is, where it's still to be determined, but we'll keep you up to date. <clears throat> Lastly, again, like to thank our partners at uh, Harold Christian Health Center. Um, they were able to help vaccinate our 1B staff <clears throat> and other volunteers uh, on the staff side. And, and just as importantly, the Temple City Unified School District staff as well, a little over 100. We did over we did over 1,200 um, vaccinations. Mary Yu was at a, a press conference yesterday with the supervisor and our fellow uh, neighboring partner cities throughout this part of the San Gabriel Valley. So really happy that we could do that. We do not have a date for our second clinic yet. We are waiting uh, with Harold Christian Health Center. Once we have that, we'll make sure you know come by, visit, um, safely social distancing, masking and all that. Um, it'll be my turn to volunteer at this next one. So um, I'll be out there uh, as well. Um, so thank you to them and thank you for, and council, thank you for your support um, uh, in allowing us and permitting us to do that as well. I think it was a great event. Uh, lastly, just thank you for your continued support as we hopefully get this, Things are looking so good. Uh, unfortunately, you know, with the variant, with what's happening with spring break and everything else, hopefully we do not. All this amazing hard work that we've done as a city, uh, I, I, we want to make sure that we jog and don't sprint <laughs> towards transitions as we have cautiously and you've given us such strong support throughout this pandemic too. And thank you to the public for uh, really an understanding and patience. We've really tried to deliver the level of service that you expect. And uh, and it's in some ways it's been done very differently and will be done very differently for the months to come. But hopefully as we transition and we jog but not sprint towards uh, the newest, the new phase of this pandemic and hopefully with um, the pandemic looking backwards and not forwards. Thank you, Mary Yu. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cook. Uh, Mr. Murphy, yes. City Attorney, uh, do you have any updates for us? I will give uh, as brief an update as I can tonight on some proposed housing legislation uh, that's coming through. Uh, as we all know, last year, uh, the legislature was was uh, kind of thrown off their normal housing bill um, uh, party by the, the pandemic. This year, they're back in force. Uh, the most broad of all the bills is Senate Bill 6 which uh, would actually require all local jurisdictions to allow uh, residential, multifamily residential uh, housing to be developed in commercial zones. Um, it's kind of an interesting one. Senate Bill 15 would allow that kind of uh, uh, sort of reuse of commercial zones but would provide incentives in the form of grants to the local governments who chose to do that. So that was uh, actually mm -hmm. Senator Portantino's response to Senate Bill 6 was to bring Senate Bill 15. And it looks like it's an attempt to, to at least give us some option. Um, let me look at a few more. Uh, Assembly Bill 617 is kind of an interesting one. It, it seems to recognize that the regional housing needs assessment allocations, the, the RENA allocations that we've all been dealing with, uh, have seemed off to, to a, a lot of local entities. And uh, it actually, if it passed, it would allow jurisdictions the option to pay other jurisdictions to transfer a portion of the, the RENA allocation uh, essentially from one city to another. So we're going to keep an eye on that one as well. Uh, finally, uh, Senator Weiner, uh, always our best friend in terms of, of taking away control of housing, uh, actually proposed a bill this year uh, that would, uh, again, give us an option to uh, make uh, any single family residential zone uh, duplexes or fourplexes 
uh, but wouldn't actually require it. And, and that's one of the things that we've been asking of Senator Weiner for years is that uh, you, you give the cities that want to do this an option, but don't force it on everyone. So maybe this one, uh, as proposed, will actually go through and will be something that, uh, that local jurisdictions can support. We're obviously watching all of them. Uh, come August, I'll report again on the ones that were adopted and which ones we think the governor will sign in September. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, next item is council reports regarding ad hoc or standing committee meetings. Um, do we have any reports from any committee? I guess not. At this time, um, I think uh, we do have some uh, vacancies coming up uh, for our commissioners. Coming, uh, they'll be expired. Some position will be expiring on June 30th, um, uh, 2021. Um, so at this time, I would like to ask for volunteers to um or like to form the uh, uh city uh, city commissioner recruitment uh standing committee and would like to ask for volunteers uh, from the council members uh, mayor you Anyone i would uh, volunteer i haven't been on that committee for a while so i would volunteer yeah thank you uh, council member chavez um anyone else like to help? Yeah, I'll do it. If Tom can do it, I can do it. <laughs> uh, I heard that Councilmember Mant, um, um, and also Councilmember Scar. So, oh, that's that's fine. Well, I think Ca Councilmember Scar hasn't done it for a while. So. <laughs> yeah, I was well, feeling well, somewhat guilty. Well, William, if you, if you, William, I don't mind stepping down if you want to go ahead and do it. That's fine with me. I've, I've, I've been doing it for a long time. So if you, you're, you're okay, if you, if you're okay with it, that's okay. fine. Okay. Uh, I'll do it. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All, all three of you. So uh, council member Mann and council uh, member Viscar will be our new uh, standing committee uh, for the commissioner recruitment. And next item is council item separate from the city manager's regular agenda um starting with council member Chavez. thank you thank you mary you um i think for at least the next 30 days our city manager should have a cheat sheet next to him with all the names and titles of everyone um so that uh, just to help him uh guide him what do you think is that i think that would be a good idea uh brian Brian's not taking it too well, though. I guess <laughs> we all we all fall all into that. I can get. I need all the help I can get, sir. And we fall into that trap all the time. I know. Um, on a on a more serious note, um, I just want to share with all of you that uh, I just found out that uh, Matt Byers uh, was in the hospital and uh, had some emergency surgery done. So our prayers go out to him. I, I understand he's doing fine. So. Um, but you know, a little bit of scare there. So you know, he was. You know, I think all of you know Matt, and uh, I wish join me in wishing him well. And with that, that's it. My clock's going off, so I better turn off my my mic. <laughs> all right, uh, Councilmember Man. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, nothing big to share, but I I do want to just uh, extend my appreciation to. Uh, Christian Her Harold Christian Center for working with um, our staff, Parks and Rec staff, public safety staff, in, in doing the, the clinic. And as Mr. Cook reported, it, it went well. Uh, and it's it's great to also be able to assist our uh, colleagues over in the in the Temple City Unified School District as well. I, I know they're they're struggling with um, a lot of questions of reopening schools and how that, that's going to roll out. And, um, you know, we, we deal with a different set of challenges here on the city and uh, the school side is, um, at least from what I've observed, uh, is, is equally, if not more challenging. They're, they're dealing with a very different universe. So um, extend my appreciation for the, the school board and the school district for their work, but also extend my condolences for the headaches they have to deal with, with 
all the constant changes. That's all. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Viscar. Any items? Yeah, I too went by um, the vaccination location, and I was really impressed with with the quality of the work that that we, as well as the other volunteers, were doing. And uh, I already had my experience getting my two, and and while it wasn't bad, these folks were even more professional. So, and 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 organized, very well organized. So congratulations, Brian. Credit to Mr. Matsumoto, Mr. Matsumoto and Mr. Arizumi and all the staff who put in a lot of hard work to get there. Good. All right, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Starquist. Yes, I just want to um, give a shout out to our uh, tree workers that have done such a beautiful job. If you drive around the city, you'll see a lot of newly planted trees. So I think our um, city is going to look beautiful this spring. So um, Brian, please share how nice everything is looking. Um, uh, regarding the schools, the superintendent sent out an update this evening and in person, I guess they're called stable groups. They are going back TK to third on April the 5th. So um, that's pretty soon. And then grade 12, seniors go back on April 5th also. And then grades four to six on April the 12th. So I don't know how many families are going to send their children back, but I guess we can be looking at maybe um, letting our sheriffs know, just so that, uh, you know, the parking's always a <laughs> problematic, Brian. So if we can just keep uh, those two dates and to know that uh, the kids will be back in school. And just want to thank Tinny and, um, now I can't, I don't see her name up. Who worked um, on our plan. Ms. Grant. Yes. Thank Grant. them for the, um, the work that they did. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you, Greg, for those updates. It's always interesting to see what Mr. Wiener is doing. So thank you for those. All and right. That's it. Um, I, I all right, thank you. I, I too want to echo um, the great job that uh, staff and uh, Carol Christian had uh, done in, in providing a vaccination clinic. I also visited, um, uh, like a council member Viscara, and I was just so amazed how efficient, how nicely organized. I was really proud to stand there and watch how our city staff, along with Harold Christian, uh, had served the community and uh, people were. I mean, I didn't go up to talk to everyone because of social distancing, but you can tell they're very happy to, to have the opportunity. Everything was so well, well organized, well run. So I was really proud to stand in and watching um, what we have provided the community. And uh, yeah, like um, uh, Mr. Cook had mentioned, I went to a press conference with the Supervisor Barger and along with several other cities that um, Harold Christian had partnered um, a city of Rosemead, a city of Acadia, a city of um, San Gabriel, a city of Monterey Park. All in all, they actually, Harold Christian had given 10,000 shots. So that's quite a number. So I, I'm glad that we're part of that uh, effort as well. And uh, we'll look forward to the next one. And um, with, so that's my comment. And um, thank you. And next item is public comments on item not listed. Um, Madam Clerk, are there any emails requests to speak? Mayor, I actually have two email public comments, if you allow me to read them. Yeah, please. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and put the um, time clock, timer clock before I read them. Okay, the first one is from uh, Jay Palmeroy, and his comments are 
Good evening, Mayor Yu and Council Members. My name is John Pomeroy, and I'm a former school board member. I write today to urge you to take a common sense action to help protect young people in this great city. I ask you to join San Marino and many other cities that have adopted the st safe storage ordinance, which would require that all firearms in a home be securely stored in a locked container or disabled with a trigger lock. One small child dies almost every day in this a country after finding an unsecure firearm in their own home or in a relative's home or while playing at a friend's house. On average, two older children die every day in this country by suicide from an unsecure firearm they obtain from their home or another family member's home. Research shows that keeping guns securely stored does not hinder self-protection, but can go a long ways towards preventing unintentional death of children and teen suicides. Storing firearms in a securely locked container can also prevent guns from being easily stolen in a home robbery. A DOJ approved safe storage device can be obtained for as little as $40, so the cost is not at all prohibitive. Storage devices are available that allow gun owners to quickly ac access their firearm when necessary. While the California Penal Code addresses this issue, it is inadequate because it does not define how to safely store a firearm and it doesn't apply to all homes. The, pe the penalty for violating the safe storage ordinance should be a civil penalty in the form of a fine or community service rather than a criminal penalty. Importantly, enacting such an ordinance would give the city the opportunity to educate the public on the dangers to all people, excuse me, to young people of firearms that are not safely stored. Thank you for your time. Thank and you. Second comment, excuse me. Second public comment is from Thomas. Liang, dear respectful council members, as you all may have noticed, there is a increase in hate crime and violence targeting Asian American across the whole country. This, there is a recent message circulating online saying a Temple City resident while he was walking with his dog, he was verbally attacked by a man with a racist comment. And this man also tried to physically attack him and follow him to return to his home. His case was reported to the police. Fortunately, this Temple City resident was not hurt. Since this is said to happen in Temple City and we have such a large proportion of Asian population residing here, I would much appreciate it if the city can take some measure to avoid such racist attack happening here. This includes an open condemnation of such racist action or any action that the council think is appropriate. Thank you very much, sincerely. Well, thank you for the comment. Um, uh, Madam Clark, um, would you unmute the phone and to see if we have any callers? We have just one caller. We just have one caller, but no request to speak. Okay. Well, uh, if, if there are no... Uh, no caller then uh, i will close public comment and this being our last item so we will adjourn for the evening uh have a good one everyone thank you thank you, thank you mr mayor good night good night good night, good night.